Well, Elon Musk is now the richest person on the planet. More than half the satellites in space are owned and controlled by one man. Starting his own artificial intelligence company. Well, he's a legitimate super genius. I mean, legitimate. He says he's always voted for Democrats, but this year it will be different. He'll vote Republican. There is a reason the U.S. government is so reliant on him. Elon Musk is a scam artist, and he's done nothing. Anything he does yeah. is fascinating to yeah. people. Welcome to Elon Inc., where we discuss Elon Musk's vast corporate empire, his latest gambits and antics, and how to make sense of it all. I'm your host, David Papadopoulos. On Friday, SpaceX is scheduled to launch its Starship spacecraft for the second time. The first one went well until it didn't. It was detonated within minutes of launch. A lot in space travel, of course, can go wrong and has gone wrong. But we also now know from a new Reuters investigation that even when things go well, behind the scenes, they can get very messy. To discuss this and more, we brought in Lauren Grush, who covers space for us here and is the author of The Six, the untold story of America's first women astronauts. Welcome, Lauren. Hello. Thanks for having me. Sarah Fryer, who oversees our coverage of Silicon Valley's biggest companies. Hi. Hello, Sarah. And Max Chafkin, senior reporter at Bloomberg Businessweek. Hey, how's it going? Hello, Max. All right, but we're going to start back in Texas with you, Lauren. Just remind us why Starship is so important to the company and to Musk's multi-planetary vision. Sure. So I guess you could say Starship is what Elon has been working towards since the very beginning. He founded SpaceX to start a civilization on Mars. And in order to do that, you need quite a large rocket to get people there. And so Starship is ultimately that transportation system that will take people to deep space des destinations. Right now, they're kind of working toward the moon as NASA is looking to go back to the moon. And Starship holds a multi-billion dollar contract with NASA to take the agency's astronauts to the moon first. But eventually, the goal is to take upwards of, you know, hundreds of people to Mars and then, uh, you know, bring them back at some point as well. And so back in April, you were there. What happened? What went wrong? Well, a lot of things didn't <laughs> quite go as planned. As I could see, as I was watching it launch, um, multiple Raptor engines on the rocket flamed out. As I was watching it, I turned to the person next to me and I said something like, uh, is that supposed to happen? But... The rocket kept climbing, so I, I, I just kept filming it and watching it. But as it turns out, that was not supposed to happen. So multiple engines either failed or didn't even start up during the launch. And then as it climbed towards space, there's a portion of the flight where the vehicle intentionally separates. It's known as stage separation. And there are two stages on Starship. There's the Starship spacecraft itself, which is the top portion of the rocket, and that's what would presumably carry people and cargo someday. And then you have the booster, what's known as the super heavy booster. It's the very long piece at the bottom that is needed to really get it out of, you know, the Earth's gravity and get it into orbit. Well, at some point, you know, the stages are supposed to separate because it gobbles up all the fuel in that super heavy booster. When that time came, the vehicle started to spin out of control. And then eventually SpaceX opted to intentionally destroy the vehicle. Yeah, they, 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 they shot it down, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a precautionary measure with a... a system known as the flight termination system. It's embedded in every rocket and it's used for this exact scenario. So in case things don't ac go according to plan, they intentionally blow up the rocket to make sure it doesn't veer, you know, into a crowded area and cause unintended damage to the public and property. After that explosion, they fixed their problem since then? They're ready to go? That's what SpaceX says. The FAA came up with a list of corrective actions that they need to implement. One of the biggest updates that you'll see during this flight is the addition of what's known as a water deluge system. So the way Elon described it is basically a, a shower head, but pointed upward. So they've, they've installed these steel plates underneath the launch pad or the launch mount 
that will gush water underneath the rocket when the engines fire, and that's meant to mitigate and lessen the forces that are created when those engines ignite. I mean, you have to remember, this is 33 Raptor engines that are supposed to ignite, and they're very powerful engines. So, And that was ultimately what caused all of the destruction last time. They really didn't have any mitigation measures in place. And so I was actually <laughs> re-watching the live stream from the original Starship launch, and I could see the chunks of concrete kind of flying everywhere during that initial takeoff. So hopefully the deluge system will prevent that from happening this time. The launch pad basically blew up, Max. Yes, which, I mean, happens when you're launching experimental rockets. And like these, I, you know, I almost feel like this is the area where Elon Musk is sort of most comfortable, right? Where he's sort of trying to develop a new technology, where he's able to like lower expectations sufficiently where a, 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 a little explosion is just kind of like a bump in the road. Right, because the they, were, to, they were celebrating. Yeah, yeah, and I think you could argue, I mean, Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I feel like you could argue that it was a success. I mean, right, this is, they achieved something they hadn't yet achieved. And again, experimental vehicles, like they don't need to get to Mars in one boom. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> SpaceX has been very clear that their approach to testing and development is very iterative. And, you know, they like to go and fly things and push them to their limits until they break. And that helps them to learn. And then they come back and do it again. The issue that they have, though, is that they built Starship and Starbase, this launch facility that in Boca Chica, next to a wildlife refuge. And so, you know, they can blow up their own launch pad as much as they want. But, you know, when it crosses into potentially harming animals in the area or, you know, causing damage to uninvolved public and property. And it did, right? I mean, it would it cause tremendous amounts of damage. Yeah, I do want to be clear. It was just the intense force of the launch itself that caused the most damage on the ground. They hadn't put in enough mitigation measures that most orbital flights normally do. And this is the potentially the largest and most powerful rocket ever developed. What does SpaceX say? So what would its what would its response to all this be? I would say the response is that they it it happened exactly as they hoped. You know, they wanted to learn and they are happy to damage and destroy their own launch pad as much as possible. I think they obviously don't want to cause any unintended consequences to the nearby environment or but at the same time, I think they they would blow up their launch pad as much as possible if it meant learning, you know, new things about their vehicle and they'll happily, you know, rebuild again and again. I think in the long term, they don't want to continue blowing up their launch pad. But in these early days of testing, that is just a, a side effect of learning and pushing the envelope forward. Now, Max, more recently, Reuters uh, published a a uh, long investigative piece looking into the raft of injuries sustained at SpaceX facil facilities. And so it's pretty much a look at, uh, at the human toll of what we call Musk speed, right? That yeah. relentless drive to get new products ready, get them out the doors as fast as possible. I mean, am among the findings in their story, there have been 600 injuries of SpaceX workers since 2014, more than 100 workers suffering cuts or lacerations, 29 with broken bones or dislocations, 17 whose hands or fingers were crushed, nine with head injuries. You had five burns, five electrocutions, eight accidents that led to am amputations. One man is in a coma and one man is dead. Is this, of course, at any industrial site, there will be injuries. Right. Is this abnormal? Well, I think, so So two things. One is, like you said, SpaceX is going to say that they're doing their best, you know, they're taking appropriate precautions. But we have read stories like this about Tesla. And and in some ways, it's not surprising, especially given what we know about Elon Musk. If you know, if you've looked at the Walter Isaacson book, you've mm -hmm. seen scenes in which SpaceX engineers are sort of like drinking heavily, doing things in the middle of the night. It, it doesn't. Now, again, I don't think there's any allegation that any of that played into these injuries. And even when you listen to things that Musk says about this, you know, Musk talks about you know, the, the, the distinction between sort of regulations uh, that don't have anything to do with physics and laws mm. of physics. You know, laws of physics are, are requirements. Everything else is a recommendation is, is a line that uh, comes up over and over again in the Walter Isaacson book. The other thing is, I do think this is pretty damaging. Aerospace 
is an industry where safety standards really matter and where where accidents can be super problematic. You know, the the long term goal is, as Lauren's talking about, is to send regular people up in these rockets and and anything that that sort of dents that the aura of safety or reliability or anything like that can be long term damaging. I would also mention that, you know, the reason that this, I think these things happen, it, it's, it stems from the culture and the frenzy that Elon creates about the need to get to Mars as quickly as possible. He said many times before that the window to Mars is open now and it could close. So we need to work as quickly as possible to get there. And so that creates, I think, a kind of crazed environment to work as quickly as possible to to at all costs, you know, and that's why we know that SpaceX has a bit of a burnout culture and that, you know, people, like you said, are working through the night and and have a lot of anxiety just to try and get these things done to fulfill that mandate that Elon has. I mean, I think that the the Mars rush is sometimes, as we saw in the in the Isaacson book, another reporting, sometimes he just ha- gets in a mood and he thinks, I have this new idea. I, I want to fix it now or I want to change this now. We are, you know, we had this as our priority, but our priority is now this. And it starts tonight on a Friday night. You know, it, it is just it's just the way he works. And I think some employees find that extremely exciting. Now, Lauren, if I'm correct here, SpaceX did not comment for this story, did not comment to Reuters for this story. Um, in general, their public posture in terms of how they treat safety, workplace safety at SpaceX is what? And I imagine they would say that it is, uh, you know, a high priority. SpaceX is one of, if not the biggest partner with NASA right now. And when it comes to how they work together with the space agency, you know, safety is very a top priority for NASA. And so when it comes to at least how they certify their vehicles to carry people to space, what is involved with making sure that their vehicles and their rockets and their capsules are up to NASA standards, that is very heavily oversighted. And so, you know, there is definitely regulation and oversight in a lot of things that SpaceX does it's, you know, but there are other things I'm sure, you know, NASA isn't there every single day. As I was thinking about this, you know, I was thinking about when you when you take a few steps back from the Elon Musk, like the, the Elon Musk story, right? It's all about applying the lessons of software to hardware. And that is like super useful, I think, to a point, right? Because software is very iterative. You can fix it. You can have little issues, you can have little things break, and no one cares, right? Software companies all the time, including really big ones like Apple, ship products that are not fully baked or that have problems that are being fixed kind of in real time. And that is like a recipe for innovation. I just think like this kind of gets at the limitations of this approach. And like you can talk about, you know, the fail fast mentality or whatever, but when you're, you know, there's an anecdote in there about somebody dropping like a very heavy piece of equipment. Pound yeah, a hundred pound or, yeah chunk of something not concrete <laughs> you know down and and like at a normal company and, and it like landed at somebody's yeah, feet yeah, and, it didn't and, hurt anybody but they were like my god in the story kinda, it says that yeah. a normal company that would get you fired at spacex it doesn't and i think like that is telling and that that allows obviously allows you to move faster but it it it, it reaches move a breaking faster point. and also by the way race ahead of boeing race ahead of blue origin right and yeah, win it, they are they are in many ways dominating the space race we talked about Elon Musk's relationship with workers last week as it applies to Tesla. But, you know, you kind of see it here, too, when you're dealing with like big industrial plants with heavy equipment and and things that can kill or maim you very easily. It requires a different approach. One last bit of SpaceX news here. So we had a story last week showing that revenue at Starlink, uh, the SpaceX unit that puts small internet satellites up into space, that revenue there is growing and apparently growing quite a bit so fast that it'll account for more than half of SpaceX's total revenue by next year. Lauren, this strikes me as surprising. What do we make of this? Well, I think from the very beginning, Starlink was meant to be a bit of a moneymaker for SpaceX. I think there were some early documents that came out a few years ago before they even started launching that 
projected very high revenues for Starlink. They're also very tenacious about finding new businesses for Starlink. So while they have the customer consumer facing business, they're also very eager to get Starlink government customers into planes, onto cruise ships, things of that nature. So I think if you read the tea leaves, it's clear that Starlink is very important to SpaceX in terms of being kind of this moneymaker to help generate funds to, you know, for that ultimate goal of So going that they to can Mars keep and... blowing up rockets as they <laughs> push sure. higher and higher into And space. find demand for all of these rockets that they want to launch. Like they're they're launching these gigantic, as Lauren's saying, giant bigger rockets than anyone's ever right. launched, you know, these enormous uh, enormous number of uh, launches of the earlier generation of rocket, right? Like they kind of need something like Starlink to to fill up their boats. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that while SpaceX is this very successful company and does all of these amazing things, it still remains to be seen if space is a profitable business. The truth is making money on space is still extremely difficult. And so I think SpaceX is trying to find kind of where they can create that revenue stream through space so that they can support all of these other endeavors. And we're still kind of seeing if Starlink will be that moneymaker that they hope it will be. The one last thing that's interesting on this, though, is they at the same time are talking about potentially spinning off Starlinks in an IPO, at, at which point, sure, you get an influx of cash, but I guess your 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 cash cow to fund your... Um, your rockets it's just not, goes away. And it's not totally clear that it is, I mean, it can, it clearly is, could generate a lot of revenue, but it's not clear that this is a, a super profitable business. Well, like, apparently it's breaking even this year for yeah, the first time. And last year, you know, Musk was complaining that they were losing huge amounts of money in the context of the, the sort of argument over whether he should deploy more devices to Ukraine. Welcome back. Now, Elon is a pretty busy guy. He's running six companies, and yet he's been spending his time giving multi-hour podcast interviews, although not to this one. Elon, if you're listening, you are always invited. He talked to Joe Rogan for close to three hours and then to Lex Friedman for over two. Uh, Sarah, amid all this talk, tucked in there somewhere, there were comments on the political evolution of Twitter as it became X. What did he have to say? Yeah, between the talk of of aliens and and everything else, there was there was a, a pretty interesting quote about X, and, and it, it encapsulates what he said before. Take a listen. Because Twitter was controlled by far left activists, objectively, they they would describe themselves as that. You know, so so if sometimes people are like, well, has it moved to the right? Well, it's moved to the center. So from the mm-hmm. from the perspective of the far left, yes, it has moved to the right because everything's to the right from the far left. But no one on the far left that I'm aware of has been suspended or you know, banned or deamplified. So, you know, but we're, we're trying to be inclusive for the whole country. And so what's interesting here is, is that Bloomberg has actually reported based on third party research that in the months since Musk took over Twitter and turned it into X and loosened the rules that he thought were liberal activist rules, you actually saw an uptick in, in hate speech and racist speech, anti-Semitic speech. And, and that's not so much a thing that people care about in terms of politics as much as they care about in terms of the user experience. People don't want to Mm. come to a social network and feel bad. They don't want to experience, you know, hate and and racism. And advertisers don't want to spend their money there. It can be, you know, a chilling effect on people who feel like they're in in the minority or being being attacked to speak out there. And we've seen that migration away from X. and and so I think I think it's just worth thinking of those comments and that framing where it's like it is a it is a business decision and one that's actually gone poorly for him. OK, so in this interview, Sarah, he also rekindled an old feud with ChatGPT Sam Altman, former business partner of Musk, now a rival. What's the deal? There? Oh, there's some history here. So so OpenAI started as yeah, Musk says in in his his chatter about it. And the name, <laughs> uh, the the open and open AI is supposed to mean open source, and it was created as a non profit open source, and now it is a closed source for maximum profit. Which I think, 
It's not good karma. So the the thing to understand here is Musk was a large backer of this open AI project back when it was um, considered a nonprofit, um, back when they were trying to, you know, solve solve the issues with with um, AI taking over and and doing harmful things. And and yeah, it has become a for profit company. But the context there is is Musk just launch his own for-profit version of of Grok, uh, which we spoke about in the last episode. And so now we've seen this this very public brawl between Sam Altman and Elon Musk, where they're throwing shade on each other through memes on Twitter. You know, Sam Altman made fun of of Elon Musk's Grok as being like the the dad joke, the cringy dad joke version of AI, and and Musk responded in a way that sort of confirmed his hypothesis. So Max, where does the Altman feud rank in the pantheon of Musk feuds? I mean, is this like Zuckerberg level, AOC level? Should I think Sam this Altman is feud? like a top two hundred, top twenty feud. Oh, okay. It's definitely one of the one of the key, and and at the moment, I'd say it's like in the top five. But when you when you step back and look at the you know panoply of of elon feuds i, I want to offer one update from the world of sports on this <laughs> on this podcast interview right. lex friedman a, a very broad definition yeah. of sport lex friedman trained or or ah. you know maybe wrestled with elon right. musk and grappled mark zuckerberg with. grappled right. there were some pictures on twitter and there was no mention none of the cage fight during this entire two and a half hour podcast how's that possible unforgivable if you ask me so Back to the cage so fight. I, I promise an update but it's it's sort of a non-update Back. It's a, Sorry, I can't Sarah, remember, myself. it's always about Ugh. the cage fight. For our final segment today, we've got this biopic coming out. Uh, timeline unknown, but in Musk speak, I'm, I'm sure they're saying it's going to come out in two weeks and it'll come out in three years. It's all about his life. Director Darren Aronofsky is said to be working with A24 on it, based on the new Walter Isaacson biography of Musk. And, you know, what it's got us thinking here is, I mean, we need a cast. We need a dream cast for this, okay? So I'm going to start with you, Max. Okay. Who will play... Elon Musk. Okay, I just very quickly want to explain yes. my thinking here because Aronofsky is not a funny guy. His movies are very dark, um, surreal, fair. very dark. And I think that's kind of a problem because I think the Elon Musk story needs a little levity. I mean, this is somebody, he's not always funny, but he tries to be. And so I think the key here to marry Aronofsky's dark aesthetic Roman with Polanski Elon's type approach. weirdness is to cast a comic actor in a serious role, which often is is Oscar bait. So I have two thoughts here. One is I want to start with Linda Yaccarino, and I think Amy Poehler is the ideal okay. Linda Yaccarino. I'm taking Yaccarino. notes. And for Elon, now this is a very important casting decision. I think there's going to be lots of other ideas. I'm suggesting Tim Robinson, who's a comedian. If, if you haven't heard of him, but you, you've seen the gif of a guy in a hot dog suit saying, yeah, yeah. we're all looking for the guy who did this. He's a sketch comedian, does a lot of cringe comedy. And I think both in spirit <laughs> okay. and in content, he would be perfect to play I, Elon I, Musk. I, I could go with that. Sarah? So I am really, really bad at casting decisions. So I phoned a friend on this one, my friend Walter Hickey, who just wrote a book on Hollywood. I liked his casting decisions for Grimes. He he brought up Anya Taylor-Joy or Lady Gaga. I think they both would be really good Grimes. Mm. You need someone mm. a little edgy. Okay. I think... Grimes being the on-again, off-again partner uh, of Musk's and, and... And mother of... of some of Musk's children. I, I'm not sure that we know the number, if we're honest. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, is it two? Lauren, I think is the latest two or three? is three, as far as we know. Okay. Lauren Grush, who do you got? Yes. So I've been thinking about this for a while because I put together, in terms of just pure likeness, I've thought about this one actor for a long time. I know he probably has done more, but I know him pre predominantly from the show Lost, if anyone remembers that. His name is Kevin Duran, and if you Google him, I think he's the one that looks most like Musk. I, I don't think I'm the only one that's come up with this connection either. So just in terms of pure looks, I go with I got gotcha. you. I got to say, also, I am not the only one to suggest Tim Robinson. I, I saw that on Twitter, but I think it's Wait, a very no, good whoa, idea. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, came, you stole it from somebody? It seems like Sarah stole. I did. I, I'm not no, good at casting. Sarah at least cited her source. Mine, <laughs> mine, for what it's worth, I only have one. 
I've got someone for Musk. And we're going to have to bring someone back from the dead, though, which if anybody could do it, Musk, I feel like Musk will create a company in which he brings back people from the dead. And then sort of in the same vein as as Max, I've got Robin Williams. Whoa, that's interesting. I think we're going to need a cameo here. And I and I was thinking <laughs> you, you kind of want like a, a really hot cat turd, if you ask me. <laughs> and so Timothy Chalamet as cat turd. Just come in and out. <laughs> enough with the enough with the casting. We'll take your ideas, though, listeners. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening to Elon Inc. And thanks to our panel, Lauren, Sarah, Max. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. This episode was produced by Stacey Wong. Naomi Shaven and Rehan Harmansi are our senior editors. The idea for this very show also came from Rehan. Blake Maples handles engineering and we get special editing assistance from Jeff Grocott. Thanks a bunch to Jilda DiCarli and to Bloomberg Business Week editor Joel Weber. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen. The Elon Inc. theme is written and performed by Taka Yasuzawa and Alex Sugiura. Sage Bauman is the head of Bloomberg Podcast and our executive producer. I am David Papadopoulos. If you have a minute, rate and review our show. It'll help other listeners find us. See you next week.